All right, this morning we're in a series continue, and as we continue in the series continue, uh, we're looking at the title, The Life of a Disciple. The Life of a Disciple. If you join me in Matthew 16 and verse number 24, Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and what church? Follow me. Let's pray and ask God to teach us how to be better disciples for His glory. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we enter into this Sunday school lesson this morning, we understand that we have a great privilege, but yet a great responsibility to continue as disciples indeed. I do pray for those who are teaching other people the Word of God, that you would give them wisdom. And then, Lord, take us today as teachers, as well as those who are continually being discipled, and allow us to grow in your grace. I pray that we would never become stagnant, but that we would become filled with your power, and that we would move on for your honor and glory. We ask all these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said... You know, there's a difference between stagnant water and fresh water. Uh, When I was a teenager at camp, we would go down to this place south of Tremont and Mackinac, uh, actually where the old Baptist church was down there uh, in uh, the Tremont area. And uh, one of the things that we liked to do during summer camp was we like to take up some plastic and lay it down the hill to this old little pond, actually. really wasn't even really a lake. Uh, but that was so nasty, but yet so fun. Because as we'd spray dial soap and water on the plastic, we would then slide down and launch off the jump area into not a freshwater pond, but something that was actually green. That when you splashed into it, the green would go up. When you popped your head up above the lake, green was hanging off of you. It wasn't a freshwater area. Up in Alaska this past trip, uh, we took a walk up to Angel Rocks. And as you take the hike up to Angel Rocks, there's actually a sign and a shoot off of the trail where it actually has a picture of drinking water. And it's just a freshwater stream that comes down from the mountain that is perfectly good to drink. And it's some of the best water you may have. And uh, we enjoy taking a drink from that water. There's a difference between the two. Just like there's a difference between a stagnant Christian and a Christian who is fresh for God. When we look at verse 24 of Matthew 16 again, the Bible says, If any man will come after me, Jesus says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, if you have the book, it's also written right in there. But in the Word of God, at Luke chapter 14, we continue with some of Jesus' teachings. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25, the Bible continues, And there went a great multitude with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come unto me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, And his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then look at verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. In this lesson, we will look at what the life of a disciple looks like. Being a true disciple is a process of surrender daily, battling sin in our lives, and living a lifestyle that is pleasing to God. What does it mean to fully follow Jesus, someone once said. Salvation is the miracle of a moment, but discipleship is the process of a lifetime. So at the moment of your crying out to God, there isn't going to be this instant perfect Christian that pops out. But there will be a lifetime of discipleship. Take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 12 as we study the Word of God together. Romans chapter 12, I hope you have it memorized. I hope you could recall it at the drop of a hat and at the turn of a dime. But in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, we read the truth of full surrender. It says in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your, what church? At Princeville Baptist Church on Thursday night, I, I preached how oftentimes we think in Christianity that the man of God that stands behind the pulpit, well, we expect something of him. Uh, we expect him to have a certain standard of living. We expect him to have a degree of sacrifice that we do not have. We see the missionaries come through Crossroads Baptist Church and we hear them present. Well, yes, they need to have a living sacrifice. Yes, they need to be holy. Yes, they need to be acceptable unto God. But my friends, Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1 is not dealing with the super Christian. It's dealing with the pulpit and the pew. It's dealing with everyone that names the name of Jesus Christ. There should, be, there should not be this hierarchy view of Christendom. There should be the simple fact that underneath God, we are all servants of Him, and we all should be, Romans 12, 1 and 2, believers in Jesus Christ. If you notice the statement, there's a threefold surrender based on Romans 12, 1. And as we look at our first blank, it is this. It is motivated by God's mercy to us. Then the next blank on the next page is that it is complete that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then it is reasonable is your third blank there on page number 159. Now as we think about being motivated by the mercy of God towards us, let's understand in verse number 1, that's how Paul gets your attention. Think about it. The fact that you do not deserve eternity, am I correct? The fact that you do not deserve the breath that's in your lungs, the heart that's pumping blood through your body. I mean, God has been merciful. When you think about His death for you on the cross of Calvary, that He shed His blood for your sins, it's the mercy of God that ought to compel you to say, Hey God, I want to live a sacrificial life. I want to live a holy life. I want to live a life that is acceptable for you. When I see the men of God before me and I see the missionaries before me, I understand that they're real people just like me and I'm not going to categorize them and put them up here in my mind. I mean, I should be able to look to them as an example of how to follow, but I'm not going to categorize them and put them up here and put myself down here when it's compared to the service of God. They may be going to Argentina. And by the way, thankful for our missionary to Argentina and seeing his missionary fervor in the country and already seeing God do things. But we ought to look at that and say, that's encouraging to me. I am motivated to serve God, but I understand that my surrender is just as important to Him even though I'm a church member in Peoria, Illinois and not a missionary to Argentina. And so we are motivated by the mercy of God. He's been so good to us. We are receiving from Him what we do not deserve. We deserve death. We deserve hell. But the mercy Mercy of God should compel us to live a complete life for God. If you look at verse number one, here's the complete life. That ye present your bodies a living sign. Is it important what your bodies present before God? And the answer is yes. They ought to present a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Then that phrase, and I'll show you how I like to define this to someone, just in case you're discipling someone about this. It says, which is your reasonable service. Oftentimes when I give an illustration like this, I give an illustration of a son who is expected to take out the trash. Or a daughter who is expected to do the dishes or some type of chore at the house. Son, you live in this house. Daughter, you live in this house. It is just expected of you. It is just your reasonable service for living underneath this roof that you do these things. Or you could use the illustration of your job. You could say, well, I am a such and such employee of this particular boss. And it is just reasonable for me to do the job that I am here to do. It should not be, well, I deserve all of this because I've just done what I'm supposed to do. It should just be, this is who I am as an employee. This is what I do. As a Christian, it should just be that we are a living sacrifice, that we are holy, that we do have an acceptable way before God. Then look at verse number 2. The Word of God says, and be not conformed to this world. You could stop right there to be able to show yourself in modern 
Christendom that there is no need to slant toward the way of the world. There is no reason to allow the philosophy of the world in the church. When we come to Romans 12, 1 and 2 and deal with discipleship, it should already be understood that we before God are a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And the way that we do that is by not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you'll admit it, this is where the biggest battle is faced right here. The temptations, the weightiness of sorrow, the worry that you face here, what are people thinking, what's going on. Oftentimes this is the battlefield that will then represent the life that is lived out. If you notice in your books, Matthew 10, and listen carefully if you do not have the book, Matthew 10, 37 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He is to have first place in our lives above every human relationship or commitment. I have dealt with pastors who come to me for counsel as I would travel around and some of them have actually come across and said that I had to come to the point of realizing that my relationship with God was more important than my wife. I had one pastor tell me the conviction he was under underneath one service because he was putting his wife before God. Now one thing you could say of this pastor is this, he loved his wife. And he sacrificially gave for his wife. But God was dealing with him with the fact that, that God was taken from here and replaced with his wife. And it was wife first and God second. And he said, I had to learn a valuable lesson about the proper place of people in my life. We should love our mothers and fathers. We should love our sons and our daughters. God is not telling you that you should not have compassion for them. He is asking you to consider what place do they have is is God first or are others first in your life we sing that song sometimes with our kids on how to spell joy Jesus and others and you put yourself last and spell joy you want true joy before God in your life put him first others second and yourself last let's take our Bibles and turn to James chapter 1 James chapter 1. Now as we turn to James chapter 1, we are going to recognize that a disciple battles sin and the flesh. Now I don't have to tell you that. You understand that. You know that. This is getting down to the nitty gritty, the very real, everyday part of Christian life. This is something that no preacher could ever preach away from you. This is something that attending one service could never take away from you. The fact is, every day of your life, there will be battles with sin and battles with the flesh. Sin begins in the form of a temptation, a desire that draws us away from God. Look at James 1, chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted. Let's go back to verse 14 at the beginning. But, what's the next word? Hey, don't think yourself to be above temptation. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his, what's that next word? It's not anybody else's fault. You can fall into sin of your own accord, of your own lust, and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I call verse number 15, I call that spiritual LSD. The fact that we could lust, then sin, then die in that sin. This is the process of what takes place when I go in the way of temptation. There are three main sources of temptation. Number one, the world. Number two, the flesh. Number three, the devil. 
Number one, the world. Number two, the flesh. And number three, the devil. In 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And no doubt you have heard some pretty good preachers preach on 1 John chapter 2, 15 and 16 and relate that to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they had the lust of the flesh. When they had the lust of the eyes. When they had the pride of life. They thought themselves to be as gods knowing good and evil and desiring that before God when they should not have. The world is trying to penetrate your life and change it against the glory of God. But then you got the flesh. The flesh. The flesh. That which you possess. The old patterns of your mind, your will, your emotions. And they are at odds with the new patterns that God wants to create in your life. No doubt God is wanting to create a new creature and no doubt that when someone gets saved they become a new creature. But there's something that hinders that. The Apostle Paul wrote to Christians not to lost people in Galatians chapter 5 17 through 24. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Someone who is lost doesn't have the spirit. Someone who is saved is someone who has the spirit. And the flesh and the spirit are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led by the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You notice that they listed a lot. But they did not list the whole gamut of what the flesh does. And such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When you are saved by the power of the Spirit of God, there is no law against you. The law is the schoolmaster bringing us to Christ. The law is what condemns us. And I remind you that the Bible says that the trees which bringeth forth not fruit shall be cut down and cast into the lake or into the fire. And we see here that there ought to be evidences of the fruit of the Spirit in a believer's life. These are two of the enemies, two of the ways that we are battled daily. The world and the flesh will try to rise up against us and keep us from glorifying God. And then we see the devil, Satan, actively and persistently targets the child of God with temptation. Well, things are going pretty good, we think. Everything's all right. And like a sniper who's off in the distance, we can't see his ways, nor can we fathom. But off in the distance, the fiery darts of the wicked begin to be hurled all around us. And in the moment that we thought we were okay, all of a sudden, we find ourselves immersed in the ways of the great tempter. And he is doing what he can. To overcome our lives. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 3. And when the tempter came to him, to Jesus. He said, if thou be the son of God. I command that these stones be made bread. See the devil was even trying to tempt the son of man. As he walked on this earth. If he tempted the son of man. He can tempt your life as well. Now God has given us the power to overcome temptation. He certainly has. This past Thursday. Thursday night as I was preaching in Princeville, I didn't know who they were, but they were sitting over here in my left-hand corner. Uh, if you've ever been to Princeville, back in like 2005, 2006, there was a restaurant called Coop's. Coops serves some very generous size. I mean, it was a good place to eat. I loved eating there. You guys been there before? Do they remember it? Yeah. And at Coops, they had the mason jars, which you drank out of. One of the first places I'd ever been to that did that. And I remember taking Miss Rachel there for the first time, and she got a taco salad. And the plate was one of those oval-shaped plates stacked about that high with the taco salad. Her eyes got real big, of course. It didn't even look like she touched it by the time she said, I can't eat any more of this. But long story short, this couple was 
just looking for a church to go to well after they had to close down Coops due to their health reasons. And so they were looking for a church. And this is their testimony. They won't mind me sharing it. But they had gone into Princeville for the purpose of finding a church. They got in a fight. They started going back home because they thought we can't go to church like this. They went back home. They got things resolved with each other. And then they thought the Baptist church, last time we knew, had services that start later than any other church in town. So we'll go to the church, the Baptist church. They walk in 10 minutes after being there. They said, this is where we need to be. So now these two go to Princeville Baptist Church. I think this is wonderful. This is great. She came up to me afterwards. I had given an illustration that I've given you before about the paper shredder and talking about how our sins are forgiven us. And what we like to do is we like to jump back in the paper shredder and pull out the sins which we had written down on the paper and try to piece them back together and try to live that life the old patterns the old man instead of living the new life she came up to me and she said if it's okay I'm going to start carrying a paper shredder with me in my car so I can use the illustration in my bible studies I said that's great I'm so glad that the light bulb came on and she thought this is good I can take that and use that and what the devil tries to do is play those tricks with us in our mind and tries to teach us that we are the filth of the world which we are we're unworthy before God but plays these things over in our mind and there's constant reminiscences between our flesh and the way of the devil to go back to the old man and try to piece that life back together and then we live in defeat again when God says I've done away with that life Live in the power of the new man. Your sins are forgiven you. Live over here instead of living in the flesh and the old way. My friends, God has given us power to overcome temptation. Thankfully, although we are often tempted to sin, God has given us power to overcome. Jesus died for us on the cross. He broke the power of sin over us, setting us free to respond to His power in us. Romans 6.6, 6. let's go back to look at it. Romans 6.6. 6. The book of Romans deals a lot with the grace of God and and we're going to preach on the power of grace later. And what you're going to realize through Romans is that grace doesn't give you a license to sin. But grace is what sets us free to live apart from sin to God. And when we look at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 6, we realize that knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The idea of crucifixion is not life, it is death. Our old man is crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be, what's that word? That henceforth we should not serve sin. See, he did not expect us or anticipate that because we're saved and set free, the gospel, the resurrection, the new life and the freedom, he does not desire us or expect us to run back to the old man and piece that life together and say, I desire this more than desiring the new life. But sadly, and for whatever reason, we tend to turn back to the old man. Paul would dealt with this all the time in the day he lived in. We deal with it all the time in the day we live in too in Christendom. The desires, the temptations. But my friends, Christ has given us the victory. The phrase, our old man, refers to the old nature that had no power to say no to sin. Temptation itself is not sin. But when we feel tempted, we have the power to resist the temptation. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. Now this has everything to do with the life of a disciple because if a disciple is over here trying to live in the old man and piece his old life back together he's not going to be focusing on the things of the new man and walking in the spirit of God. So we have to come to the place where we realize Christ doesn't want us to live a defeated life. He wants us to live a victorious life in the power and strength of him. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 13 you probably have it memorized if not memorize it. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. I love this next phrase. But God is what? Even when we are not, 
Who's the faithful party? God is. And when that we come across that phrase, that encourages us to go to God because we realize that He is the epitome of everything pure. He is the epitome of everything true and faithful. And if He has made a way of escape, it is a good way. And we go to Him who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that He may be able to bear it. So let's get the picture. There's a temptation that's captured you. Much like a cage would fall on an animal when they've taken the lure. And you're looking for a way to get out, but there is no way to get out in your own strength. But then you turn around and realize that because of the victory that is in Jesus Christ, there's a door in the cage. There's a way to escape. The way is through the faithfulness of God, through the purity of who He is. And when we find that door of escape, we would be foolish to live in the cage of that temptation. But yet so many people choose to stay right there. I think about the fact that God's given me a way of escape and temptation, and I rejoice in the victory that's in Jesus. If you look at page 162, you're going to see another blank. The word is use. Use the word of God. Even Jesus used the word of God when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. When you experience regular temptation or sin in a particular area of your life, find several verses, then memorize those verses so that you will have ammunition within to be able to face the temptation at hand. You know the verse, we quote it within the pledge to the word of God, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There was a military man, and man and his name does not need to be made known, but there was a military man while I was up in Alaska who came to me for counsel. And we sat for about an hour and just talked over some things. And he talked about the reality of the battle that he faces spiritually. And then he mentioned himself the need to scripture, have Scripture memorized and how valuable that's been in his life for the vast things that he fights and that he deals with. The problem is that the majority of the time that people deal with such things, they may come to a counselor, they may come to a pastor, a newthetic counselor, which means a Bible counselor. They may come to somebody who's going to share the word of God with them, but that little talk is not going to handle what happens tomorrow. Amen. What we have to do from that situation is take the living word of God that God insists every day is in your life and you hide this in your heart like Brother Gillespie preached, swing the sword and you hide the God's word in your heart that when there comes opportunity for temptation to overcome you choose in the victory of Christ and in the power of the word of God to remain a victor, a person who is more than conquerors through Christ who loves you. The word of God is so important. The next word on your page is remember. Remember you don't have to sin. I think that so many times as I've dealt with people over the years who have come with issues, they come to the place where they get so weak in their temptation that they feel that before I can get right with God, I'm going to have to sin. I don't know if you've ever thought that before, but it seems like there's people out there who say this. I mean, they come to the place where I just give up. My friends, don't give up. Stand in the power and the strength of Jesus Christ to stand. Our verses that we are going to look at this morning are mentioned right here in page 162. The grace of God, or Titus chapter 2, 11 through 12. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us that. The grace of God teaches us the following things. Denying ungodliness, worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. My friends, a Christian is going to face ungodliness. A Christian is going to face worldly lust. But a Christian does not have to give in to them if they understand the grace of God that teaches them the need to overcome those sins in Jesus Christ. Here's how we do it. Go to Romans chapter 13. Written for the Christian to the Christian. Here's how you stand against sin. In Romans chapter 13 and verse number 14... But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. 
Okay, Pastor Justin. He could easily fall into sin. He could easily go in the wrong direction. If he doesn't put on the armor of God, and if he makes a way, he creates an open door. He makes a provision, an opening in his life to be able to sin. He could go in that direction and then fulfill the lust thereof. I don't want to live like that, though. I don't know why I'd want to live like that, but I know my flesh, and I know its desires, and if I'm not careful, that way is going to be made, and I'm going to look for that opportunity to sin, and I'll fall into the error of my way. That's not why Christ died. Christ died to give us salvation the day of our salvation. Christ died to give us sanctification, the everyday process of drawing closer to God and further from the sin, being set apart in the power of His name. So therefore we see our next blank, avoid temptation when possible. Sometimes we set ourselves up for temptation by making it easy to sin. The Bible calls this making provision for the flesh. We need to do whatever we can to set up barriers and guards in our life that we may avoid it, that we may not be around it, but there's going to be times in your life where you're just passing through a place and those temptations are going to come. My friends, if you've ever driven through Las Vegas, Nevada, you understand as a man and even as a woman that there's temptations that arise from just driving through the filth of that city. You can just sense it when you come into it. And then the raunchiness and the lewdness and the wickedness of all that's put through your sights and you haven't even got to the strip yet. It's easy to be around and to be tempted. So when those temptations come, do you make a decision to avoid because you put on the armor of God again today? My friends, we do realize that even though we put on the armor of God, if we do not get to God and have His Word in our lives, we could fall so easily. The next blank on your page is unvoid, avoid ungodly friends. This really would make a difference in many people's lives. If we would just have the right friends and the right influences, that may change. You are who your friends are, somebody once wisely stated. If there are particular people who lead you into a place of temptation, don't spend time with them. There's a young man up in Alaska uh, whom I have not even talked about yet. But this young man, uh, he kind of got on me a little bit. He said, why haven't you called me? Why haven't you texted me? And honestly, I didn't even think I had his number in my phone. I looked back and there it is. Back in evangelism, I had to start putting states before the names. So I have AK, Alaska, and then the name. Because there'd be so many names I meet across the nation trying to keep up with, and they'd have the same name, and I'd get confused if it popped up and said, Josh is calling, or you know, whoever's calling. And so there it was, there's his name. But he began to tell me, and all praise to God, that he's got him back on the right path, but he was around some people that just took him down the wrong way, and he didn't care. He was in a place where, well... I'll just live this life and nobody can tell me to do any differently. I'll enjoy this. But he says, it's true, Brother Justin. The pleasures of sin are only for a season. Here's the number one thing he said besides getting back to where he should be with God. He said, the number one thing I needed to do was choose to get away from the wrong friends. Because they always took me down the wrong path. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. So here's how we do that. We may need to ask for help. Ask for help. If you are held by the bondage of a habitual sin, ask a godly mature Christian, perhaps your disciple or Bible class teacher, pastor, to pray with you and hold you accountable. In some cases, you may need biblical counsel to understand how God's word can give you victory over the specific sin that you are fighting. And how true is that? When you look at James 5 and verse 16, this is something that's rarely practiced. In fact, we as men think it's weak and very mouse-like to practice this. But James 5, 16 still says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. So let's back this up and let's think about that statement. The first part is on your end. You're the one involved in temptation. So if I'm the one involved in temptation... I need to find someone that I can confess it to. Hey, husbands, the wife is a pretty good one to confide in. Hey, wives, the husband's a pretty good one to confide in. 
And so you go to that person and you confess these faults to them and you say, this is my sin. The other person that's hearing needs to be careful what they do with that. Look down on that person? No. Isn't that the easy thing to do? A pastor comes to his people, uh, maybe to some of his men and says, these are my faults. Well, you can no longer be our pastor then. And I understand that there's certain guidelines there. We understand the qualifications and things like that. But when a pastor is struggling with him, he needs just as much as anyone, someone to confide in and someone to talk to. So then the responsibility on the one that's hearing it is not to, well, look down on the person because him that hath no sin, let him cast the first stone. But it's so easy. The flesh, the mind begins to flare up. Confess your faults one to another. And you see that and pray one for another. What am I supposed to do? If I hear some news from someone and they took enough gumption and they took enough of themselves and thought enough about the ministry of God to come to you and say, I've done this. Then you need to be one that stands like this and says, Let's pray. Not to look down the nose at the other person, but let's pray. Let's pray together. Let's seek victory together. If someone comes to you, obviously they think enough of your spirituality that you're not going to ruin their relationship with God, but help their relationship with God. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be. How do we find healing in Christ when I am at fault or you are at fault? First we confess it to someone, then we pray together about it, and then the healing power of God can move into those situations. Then that what follows is what we often claim for those really powerful preaching messages on prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What's it dealing with? It's dealing with the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of making someone right with someone else. The ministry of making someone right with God. The ministry of reconciliation is oftentimes missed out because when somebody is at fault for something, it's not handled the right way with another party. There's no praying. There's no sincerity. There's no labor for reconciliation. But yet there's tearing apart. There's criticism. There's mockery. And therefore, the church of Jesus Christ doesn't go forward, but it is hindered listen right now as far as I know things may be going well at crossroads but there could come a day where somebody falls into some type of temptation and does not find the way of escape the question is how are we going to handle it are we going to be able to forgive there will be a battle in the mind there will be a person that steps through the door and will be thinking this when Christ says forgive Seventy times seven. When Christ says, pray for them, instead of criticize them. We're going to have to make a decision at that point. How do we handle this? And I suggest we go to the Bible to figure out how. Then we keep short accounts, keep short accounts with God. The moment the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, confess it to God, agreeing with Him that it is sin, and asking for his forgiveness. Now, we believe in complete forgiveness. As we see in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 12, my little children, uh, that we, we can rejoice because our sins are forgiven us. We think of the fact that we are complete in Christ in the area of sin. I still believe in the need of confessing before God. Forgiveness is granted by the faithfulness of God as it talks about in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's the keeping the short account with God. There's the yielding to the Holy Spirit or the word yield in the next blank to the Holy Spirit. We should begin each day in prayer. That is a good practice to make. You will not find anywhere in your Bible that says start your day off in prayer. But you will find other things that seem to be more challenging. Pray without. That sounds a little bit more difficult than start your morning off in prayer. But the need to spend time with God is going to be very helpful 
and not yielding to sin, but yielding to God. In Galatians 5, 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The fact is, if someone is not walking in the Spirit as a Christian, they then make provision to walk in the flesh, and they could fulfill that which they should not fulfill. A disciple lives a sanctified life. This should be true about us. When we look at page number 164, this is what we see. The word sanctified means set apart. We serve a holy God. God calls us to live holy lives. If we go to page 165, the next blank there is that God's grace develops holiness. We're going to touch on this in the morning message, the power of grace. Again, it's referenced there on the page, Titus 2, 11 through 12. What does the grace of God teach us? That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Lots of verses that we could deal with on that topic, but we move to the application on page 167. We need to make a definite decision to fully surrender to God. We need to daily ask God... To search our hearts. Now again, this is just a good recommendation. David cried out, search me, O God, and know my heart. That's referenced there in that paragraph that you're looking at. It'd be good to make this a practice of our life. We ask you to do this before we have the Lord's Supper. Search your heart. Examine, which is the next word as we end, the word examine. Examine your life. Now the Apostle Paul looked at the Corinthian church. Two things. When the Apostle Paul looked at the Corinthian church, he said, examine yourselves. He's actually asking them to see whether or not you are in the faith. Paul said, I can't look at you and tell. He's saying this, either number one, you're lost trying to live like the church. Or number two, you are the church, but you're living like the lost. And that's why you read the Corinthians and see how he dealt with them as Christians and how he preached to them and expressed to them their need to examine and their need to search their own hearts and make a decision to live in the holiness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the life of a disciple can be very hard unless it's lived in the power of God. You can't live it by yourself. You need to live it in His strength, following His Word. Let's pray.